welcome everyone. Just a full more minutes. In the meantime, I welcome you to the third webinar of the Biennale Habitat World 2020-2022, titled Human Values and Human Thinking in the Mediterranean Area, reflecting on changes, emerging issues and new horizons. We'll just wait four more minutes before starting with the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
just a few more minutes. We're we're waiting for one of our uh, uh, special guests. So just a few more minutes while we're waiting for him, and then we can start. Thank you. Welcome everyone to this third webinar of the Biennale Habitat World 2020-2022. It'll be just a couple more minutes. We're waiting for one of our special guests and then we'll begin. Thank you for your patience. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. We can now begin. So welcome, everyone, to this third webinar titled Human Values in Human Thinking in the Mediterranean, Reflecting on Changes, Emerging Issues and New Horizons. We will soon be joining with the chairs of this digital conference, Clelia De Stefano and Riccardo Pietro Marvona. Kindly make sure that your microphones and webcams are closed throughout the webinar. You can use the chat box for messages to speakers and organizers. I thank you for your kind presence, which we greatly appreciate. Today's digital conference uh, is provided to you by Habitat World in collaboration with all our partners of the Mediterranean. Habitat World's mission is to contribute to the culture, social evolution and economic growth of the civilization by exploring the synthesis between art, nature, science and economics. Habitat World is committed to its mission in the Europe Mediterranean region by pursuing a wide array of objectives, including the promotion of research, development and implementation projects, and the periodical organization of Biennale Habitat, which is seen as a forum for dialogue and development. Over a three-year period, Biennale Habitat focuses on exploring three main themes, heritage, environment and human values. They are expressed and developed through many activities, among which academic webinars, exhibitions and collaborations with universities. 
I would like to thank everyone who has joined Habitat World in East and Nevis and welcome any future collaboration and support. In particular, I would also like to mention Dr. Capra, scientist, author, educator and activist who could not be with us for this event but is close to Habitat World and all that we stand for. The chairs of this digital conference are Claudia De Stefano and Ricardo Marvona. Claudia De Stefano was born in Naples, where she studied town management. She has traveled, studied and lived in different cities all over Europe, among which London, the Og, Barcelona and the Asturias, Paris and in the Czech Republic. There, she has worked both in tourism and IT, learning and studying different cultures and languages. Recently, she has decided to move back to Italy, where she currently resides and is collaborating closely with Abita World as the focal person to its international cooperation. Riccardo Marvona is the marketing manager of the main Italian electronics industry in Africa and the Middle East, and the facilitator of various companies for the entry into these very dynamic markets both in Africa and the Middle East, including Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and so on. As Avida World's Delegate for Sustainable International Cooperation, he is a key in proposing civil war in social inclusion, health and education projects to Somalia by offering microcredit packages to reactivate small local companies and for more modern agriculture for the livelihood of small villages facilitating access to drinking water to avoid intestinal disease and creating the availability of renewable electricity for family and small industry. As a reminder, I would like to that you kindly make sure that your microphones and web and webcams are closed throughout the webinar. And I will now leave the word to our chairpersons, Clelia and Stefano. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you for the nice presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us online for this third webinar organized by Habitat World. In collaboration with its partners, focusing on the Biennale Habitat 2020 and 2022. COVID-19 has disrupted our Mediterranean in the of life for discussion, debate, and reflections are normally conducted in person, face-to-face, -face, or around tables. Nevertheless, I'm extremely pleased to be able to share this last session and I'm elated to have with us a distinguished panel which will reflect on the theme for their, for, from their personal points of view. This webinar is the concluding segment to the other two webinars already successfully completed and will also feed into the discussions and proposals that have the world will present with the partners throughout 2020 and 2022. With the support of the Italian network for Euro Mediterranean Dialogue, REACTS, the European Economic and Social Committee of EU, ASAME, Megara, Edama, Chibafi, and Dignity, the Diplomatic Corps and the National Partners of Habitat World in the Mediterranean, some of which have been invited speakers to our webinars. Let me introduce you our first keynote speaker, His Excellency. Nabil Al Sharif, Executive Director of Analyst Foundation in Alibar, Egypt. His Excellency Nabil Al Sharif. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Hi, sorry, I, there are some technical difficulties. I'll just pick up from where Clelia left off. So, yeah, so I'll introduce you, your, our first keynote speaker is Excellency Nabil Al-Sharif, Executive Director of the Anna Lind Foundation in Alexandria, Egypt. His Excellency is the Executive Director of the Anna Lind Foundation in Alexandria, Egypt, the central institution and movement for intercultural dialogue across the Mediterranean. He is the former Senator, Ambassador and Minister for the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and he has extensive experience in public service and international cooperation. In the domain of media and communication, he held the post of Minister of Media Affairs, was the editor-in-chief of ad Dusta Arabic Daily Newspaper, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, and he is the former chair of the Jordanian Media Institute. Through his diplomatic world work, he was nominated Jordan's ambassador to Morocco, Mauritiana and Senegal. Dr. Al-Sharif obtained his PhD and MA in English Literature from Indiana University in the US. He was also the culture editor of the local Jordanian daily and wrote extensively both in Arabic and English on the need uh, for enhancing and investing in interculture and civil society dialogue. Your Excellency, thank you for your presence and your personal support to this initiative of Habitat World. Your central role in the Mediterranean is acknowledged by all. We all value your views on the topic and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. I'm very happy to be with you uh, today. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to take part in uh, the Binali Habitat uh, 2020. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, President uh, Patrignani for the kind invitation to contribute to the discussion we're having today on values and possible new thinking in the Mediterranean region. Uh, the reflections that I will be sharing uh, originate from the work, the consultations, and the research that we carry out at the Annaland Foundation. To provide some background information, the Annaland Foundation is the first institution created in 2004 to promote intercultural dialogue within the framework of the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership. The headquarters of the organizations of the organization are in Alexandria, Egypt. In order to reach the greatest number of citizens with its action, the foundation works through a network, including a large network of civil society organizations in the 42 uh, countries of the region. Probably we have the largest civil society network of any other uh, organization. We have close to 4,000 uh, organizations altogether as part of the Annaland Foundation. 15 years after the creation of the foundation and also in light of the current health crisis that we are all living in, whether south, north, east or west of the Mediterranean, I believe that the mandate of the Annaland Foundation is more relevant than ever. We believe that the pressing challenges of our societies related to the rising level of polarization and extremism, intolerance, uh, prejudices and barriers which hamper peaceful living in multicultural societies as well as the spread of populist discourses uh, present themselves as even stronger threat today. The fast spread of the coronavirus required governments and international organizations to take measures to limit physical contacts among people to contain the disease and some groups within society are already exploiting the current crisis to invoke more barriers to be created among societies. At the foundation, we have carried out regular research 
into the value systems and inclinations to cultural diversity of the people around the Mediterranean since 2010 and collected data that allows us to scientifically identify main trends and areas where our action is more needed. Also in 2020, with the, with the collaboration of a professional polling company, we are also interviewing a Euromed sample of populations of thousands of individuals. And before the end of the year, we will be able to share data, data on scientific information and analysis on the current uh, pandemic and related containment measures that are impacting our intercultural relations and people's values and attitudes. Nevertheless, I consider it important to share with you the picture of main values and attitudes of people that we have recorded before the current crisis, as well as the elements that are emerging from the broad consultations we are carrying out uh, uh, among educators, uh, youth, civil society, media, in relation to the promotion of intercultural relations in 2020. From the intercultural trends survey and related analysis, a majority of Euromed populations make positive association when thinking of the Mediterranean region as characterized by a common lifestyle and cuisine. Over time, there is a sustained high level of appetite for mutual knowledge about cultural, political, economic, and social aspects uh, of life among the people of the two shores of the Mediterranean. We have also registered a good level of intercultural interaction as 53% of, uh, uh, of Europeans and 30% uh, of uh, uh, people in the south and east of the Mediterranean face-to-face uh, -face or virtually. There, have, there has, has been at least 35% of uh, uh, either face-to-face -face, uh, or virtual interaction, uh, which leads to a more positive than negative change of perceptions of the other. The internet through social media is the first tool of intercultural, intercultural interaction for people in the southern and eastern Mediterranean shore. Uh, passing now to some initial reflections emerging from the consultations carried out with our community of stakeholders in the last month, the pandemic has had more visible challenges related to diversity and mutual perceptions through an increase in racism, prejudice, and negative stereotypes. Particular concerns were flagged regarding discrimination, hate speech, racial profiling, and fake news, especially on social media. Also, mobility limitations are undermining fundamental freedoms due to quarantine, quarantines, lockdown, and travel rest restrictions. Lack of mobility opportunities is particularly frustrating young people. Another key point from our consultation is the sudden shift from face-to-face -to, -face to remote learning and virtual interactions, where more broadly shedding light on difficulties adjusting to, uh, to virtual formats and reaching target groups due to unequal access to the internet. Among disadvantaged and marginalized groups, such as refugees and migrants in both European and Southern Mediterranean countries. This is reinforcing the digital divide, highlighting the need for investment in digital infrastructure, but also in the development of digital skills and literacy. Civil society at large is expressing the concern of access to funding. Uh, planning is becoming more challenging within an unpredictable time frame and with skills to be acquired to turn planned uh, work programs into virtual ones or with measures taking into consideration limitations on mobility. 
uh, women are among those suffering most the consequences of the pandemic. There is also a risk to witness the gender imbalance growing even further with the economic crisis looming and closure of educational institutions is a serious threat. The Annaland Foundation considers more important than ever to continue in its mission for fighting against gender stereotypes hampering full gender equality. On the other side of the analysis, the pandemic is also having some positive impact on intercultural relations, enabling people to step out of their comfort zone and uh, start rethinking of intercultural dialogue. The health crisis has uh, enabled introspection and self-actualization of people's cultural perceptions and attitudes and in the majority of the Euro-Mediterranean countries, the Annaland Foundation community has related the rising of solidarity initiatives and the media attention dedicated to these initiatives whose leaders are often young people, women, and migrants. We consider this a very important point to build the ALF message for dialogue and solidarity at the local and regional level. Uh, despite the consensus that we have registered at the ALF on the fact that uh, virtual exchange can help sustain intercultural relations, deepen existing relationships. I'm, I'm about to conclude to be a very powerful tool to counter the fueling of stereotypes across the region, our st stakeholders have reiterated the importance of face-to-face -face social interaction, which cannot be replaced by virtual interactions. At the last point, based the recommendations by our civil society network within the current context, we need to support the development of organizational resilience, innovation, and digital skills, more localized work, and flexible funding models. I would like to conclude by saying that we are all people, civil society, governments, international institutions, north, south, east, and west of the Mediterranean region are going through an unprecedented crisis. But it is also the first time in modern history that people uh, far away from each other geographically can share the emotional level uh, uh, what their peers are feeling. They, this gives us an opportunity to give new life to the Euro-Mediterranean partnership responding to the main needs of societies with the tools we have and insisting on the importance of intercultural dialogue and inter international cooperation as a key to respond to these needs and challenges. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sir. We, uh, we find your thinking extremely important in viewing the Mediterranean. We can't hear you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we find your thinking extremely important in viewing the Mediterranean and Habitat World looks forward in working more closely with you and the Anderlind Foundation through the Write Ups organization in delivering your messages, initiatives and ideas. We thank you and wish you a safe continued hard work. Let us now pass on to our distinguished panel. It is an honor for me to ask Professor Gulson Sank Lamen, the president of the European Women Rectors Association to make her presentation. The professor is founding president of the Architectural Education Association and the founding president of the European Women Rectors Association. She has been a member of the editorial boards of Open House International and the International Journal for Housing Science and its applications. She has been on numerous architectural juries at both national and international level. 
professors, uh, the professor was also elected rector of ITU, making her the first female rector of the university. During her rectorship, she undertook extensive reforms, uh, modernizing the university's undergraduate and graduate programs, restructuring the interface between the university and industry, and strengthening the international linkages of the university at every level. The professor also received several architectural prizes and is the former president of the community Medit of Mediterranean universities. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I lost. I lost the microphone. Okay. So, dear colleagues, I would like to thank Habitat World for inviting me to the third webinar of BNL Habitat World 2020. It's a great honor for me to address this gathering. I very much value this opportunity and wish you a successful uh, meeting. Before I move to my contributions, I would like to express my condolences for the people who lost their lives because of COVID-19 pandemic. Title of my presentation is Human Values, but for whom? In the content of my presentation, I will talk about a little bit human rights, human values, gender equality and sustainability, gender equality in higher education and research, then living values and present picture in Europe, and European Women Rectors Association. And I will end with a very short conclusion. Dear colleagues, when I received your invitation, I looked at the uh, third uh, pillar uh, on human values, and I started to read. And I would like to read the first sentence. The total men in the 21st century. So I understand that I should start from this sentence. Where to start? Let us first become aware of the discrimination in the words we unconsciously prefer. The discrimination, starting from the language, is exploiting to the every aspect of our life. This is why it is significant to discuss women's human rights in relation to the human values. The very basic, next please, the very busy next one. Can I move? I don't know if I can move the slides myself. Yeah, next one. The very basic entitlement possessed by every individual is human rights, which includes such rights for their health, education, property, freedom, employment, shelter, food, and in addition, significantly and concomitantly human dignity. So there are some examples of fundamental human rights that are attached to universality, basically because individuals have these rights by virtue of their existence as a human being, which I call this the point at where humankind becomes human. The very first article of Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights say that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. However, human dignity is frequently violated due to gender discrimination. Next one, please. Many women all over the world find themselves treated unequally with respect to employment, bodily safety and integrity, basic nutrition and healthcare, education and political voice. In many cases, these hardships are caused by their being women, and in many cases, laws and institutions construct or perpetuate these inequalities. Morris Cranston states this, this approach as follows. A human right, is a universal moral right, something which all men everywhere at all times, 
ought to have something which is owing to every human simply because he is human. There is no women, no she mentioned here. Nevertheless, this basic definition of universal human rights may lack harmony with particular cultural uh, practices, which means societies or cultures may have gender-based distinctions that prevent women to enjoy their human rights as individuals. Therefore, it has a vital importance to embed gender equality as a human value in various societies, cultures, regions, countries, companies, or institutions. Gender equality, women's rights, and human rights cannot be values we simply aspire to, but must be regarded as the very foundations that ground humanity itself. I quoted it from Anderson um, in the, uh, mentioned in the World Economic Forum 2020. Now I would like to move what's going on in Europe. But before that, I like to share another uh, quotation uh, from Menhart. Priorities can change any time, but values do not. Values and beliefs drive culture and behaviors. When we look at European Union, gender equality is one of the European Union's founding and core values, and it has been promoted as a core activity since 1957. There are three treaties that we have to mention. The Treaty of Rome, focused on equal pay for equal work. Second one, Treaty of Amsterdam, focused on eliminate inequality and promote equality between women and men in all areas of activity. Treaty of Lisbon, 2007-2009, bringing the obligation to eliminate inequalities and ensuring promoting equality between men and women also introduces gender equality as a determining factor for potential candidates for the accession to EU. This, this was a very important decision, I think. The European Commission's proposed 2020-2025 gender equality strategy aims at achieving a gender equal Europe where gender-based violence, sex discrimination, and structural inequality between women and men are a thing of the past. Europe where women and men, girls and boys, in all their diversity are equal. It includes six themes listed as follows. Being free from violence and stereotypes, thriving in a gender equal economy, leading equal, uh, equally throughout society, gender mainstreaming and intersectional perspective in EU policies, funding actions to make progress in gender equality in the EU, and addressing gender equality and women's empire, uh, empowerment across the world. Let us look at a little bit Habitat World. One of the main objectives of Habitat World is to contribute to the smart, inclusive, and sustainable development of societies. Accordingly, gender equality is the key to the development of peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. Putting women and girls at the center of economies will fundamentally drive better and more sustainable development outcomes for all, support a more rapid recovery, and place the world back on a footing to achieve the sustainable development goals. One other main goal of Habitat World is to put a highlight on the balance of ecosystem, and within this regard, once again, we must state that addressing gender issues and actions are crucial to achieve sustainable ecosystem management. Dear colleagues, I was director of Istanbul Technical University for two terms, eight years, and um, I started to be interested in gender equality in those years. And as I was the uh, first and only female <laughs> rector till now in its 245 years history, and um, 
when I became the, when I was elected and appointed, everybody came to me and asked me, how come you are, a, you have been a rector in a, a technical university? And that was the first time that I started to think about this gender equality issues. And since then, I started to work on this area in gender equality in higher education and research as one of my research areas. Uh, so that's why I would like to focus on that area specifically. In, re in the recent years, women established remarkable achievements in higher education, but there is still need for further substantial developments towards a women's representation in higher education research and leadership across the world. She figures are one of the most important achievements of the EC, European Commission, started to be published by 2003, based on the data provided by national authorities. She figures have played a major role in creating awareness on gender equality in every aspect of higher education and research at European level, and have become the main source for researchers and decision makers. According to the She Figures 2018, uh, there are two statements that I would like to share with you. There is a clearly diminishing representation of women alongside the path of a usual academic career. Another one, there are striking imbalances between the number of women and men at the highest level of academia in the great majority of EU countries. As you can see from this slide, although we have a 59% of university graduates are women, but when we look at the full professors, at the moment we have only 24% of full professors are female. So next slide, please. And you can see the uh, you can see how uh, women start at high level, but went down uh, to professorship level uh, by ending to 24% uh, participation. Next, please. In the EU 28, the proportion of women among heads of institutions in the higher education sector increased only from 20% from 2014 to 22% 2017. It is very, very small increase we can uh, we observe uh, for the leadership positions. Furthermore, in 2017, women made up 27% of the members of boards of research organizations, while when focusing on board leaders alone, the proportion of women decreased to 20%. As you can see from the cartoon, uh, as most of the time, our uh, male colleagues uh, prefer unconsciously we are con or consciously prefer to uh, not to have women uh, uh, around the table, but ask them, please prepare a report. So, I would like to mention about Magna Carta Observatory's Living Values Project, where equity is mentioned as an important value in, in this project. Values have been at the heart of universities since their formation, and remain an essential tool in dealing with these challenges, offering universities, universities guidance for their conduct and decision making. Observatory has launched this project in 2017 and paved the way for universities to pay attention to their values and re-evaluate them. Although there is very important, you know, uh, point that I should uh, bring uh, it to, into your uh, attention. Magna Carta did not force the uh, universities for certain value composition. There is no generally agreed canon of values and the choice of value, values is matter of each university. A list of core values has been also listed for institutional choice. One of the values listed here is equity. It includes equity of access to higher education with regard to socioeconomic background and the idea that a student population should represent the diversity of the society at large in terms of gender, ethnicity, age, religion, disability or sexuality, and also regarding social backgrounds. So we have the general picture now. 
what needs to be done after the integration of the equity as a funda fundamental value. Barriers to women's low representation in higher education and research can be listed as follows. This is not an exhaustive list, but some of the important ones are listed here. The first one, lack of transparency in recruitment and promotion processes. Unequal access to research funding. The gap between work and life balance. Limited networking and visibility opportunities. Challenges for gender neutral awards. Limited mobility opportunities and unconscious bias. Almost in all decision making levels. These barriers should be removed, but how? How can we remove them? We need change. Dear colleagues, we all know that leaders of higher education institutions play a crucial role in all change processes along with their leadership teams. Leaders can play even a change agent role at top level while integrating all the efforts coming from bottom-up decisions. We need leaders men and women who are ready to take the initiative for gender equality to create capacity for change in their institutions. That's why a handful of women came together in 2008 to establish a platform to increase the uh, women leaders in higher education and research space. And uh, later, uh, we become uh, uh, many uh, rectors across Europe and decided to establish European Women Rectors Association in 2015. Evora is a full-fledged international non-profit association established in Brussels under Belgian law in December in 2015 to promote the role of women in leadership positions in the academic sector, to adv uh, advocate gender equality in higher education and research, at European and international scales. The founding board members of Evora are Carmen Fenol from Spain, Kristen Ingolstotter from Iceland, Helena Nazare from Portugal, Ursula Neles from Germany, Gilson Salamer from Turkey, Kristina Ulenius from Sweden, Krista Varantola from uh, Finland. Dear colleagues, we are committed to address gender-based structural inequality with regard to academic leadership. And we invite you to join us by raising awareness, providing opportunities, encouraging and empowering women, academics and researchers for leadership positions. As a conclusion, informing all stakeholders about the gender desegregated data for creating awareness, convincing leadership to give priority to achieving gender balance and to take the actions for making the necessary changes could be listed as some of the essential steps developing gender equality as one of the major priority areas in the institution. Dear colleagues, let's make it happen. It is really important issue. My la last slide is very important. You can see the uh, uh, Scientist, a women scientist who are who have a Nobel, uh, who have been Nobel Prize winners. They are very, they are forming very small number compared to their male colleagues. So Evora invites you to discover not his story but her story, and we create a, please create opportunities for new ones for an inclusive, equal, and sustainable world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Your insight and contribution is of immense professional weight for us and our partners. And I'm sure they will be reviewed by all for the benefit of the Mediterranean. Our next speaker does not require an introduction as his historical work on the, on the Mediterranean is second to none. Italy is a country which is honoured to be able to call 
Tuko Professor Abulafia, Commendatore dell'Ordine della Stella della Solidarietà Italiana. This is one of the highest honors that Italy can give to an individual of repute. David Abulafia is an eminent uh, historian who has research on medieval Mediterranean trade in Sicily, the Balearic Islands and the Levant has led him to write a large history of the Mediterranean across time, entitled The Great Sea, which was awarded the, the British Academy Medal. He maintains a strong interest in medieval and early res Renaissance Italy, with an emphasis on southern Italy and the major islands. His works include a biography of Emperor Frederick II, and a series of articles about the Kingdom of Naples in the 15th century from economic, culture and political perspectives. His interest in the meeting of religions in medieval Spain and Sicily led him into the Atlantic and a study of the first encounters between Europeans and the native people of the Eastern and Western Atlantic around the time of Columbus. He has spent his career in the history faculty at Cambridge University, where he is emeritus professor at Gonville and Caius College. Not confining himself to the Mediterranean, he has also written a much praised book on the first encounters between the Western Europeans and the native societies of the Atlantic around 1492. This book is The Discovery of Mankind and Atlantic encounters in the age of Columbus. This year, the prestigious Wolfson um, History Prize has been awarded to David, David Abulafia for his book, The Boundless Sea, A Human History of the Oceans. Indeed, the professor embodies the spirit of the Biennale Habitat 2020-2022. Professor Fulafia, I thank you again for accepting our invitation and finding precious time to be with us and invite you to share your historical insights on the topic today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, I'm very honoured to be here and um, uh, it's going to be a different sort of presentation because I'm going to be talking about um, historical dimensions, so much less about the um, sort of issues that we have in the future and trying to reflect a bit on the meeting of cultures, the meeting of people in the Mediterranean. So how can a historical approach to the Mediterranean help us understand modern dilemmas? The history of the Mediterranean reveals a series of lengthy phases of integration and shorter, sometimes calamitous, periods of disintegration characterized by severe economic contraction and by political disjuncture. And it may be that with the coronavirus, we're entering one of these periods, let us hope not. Viewed from this perspective, the Mediterranean is at the moment disjointed, fragmented, fractured. Some historians even talk of the death of the Mediterranean. But this is a deviation from its character over most of the past centuries, indeed millennia. The challenge is to bring the facing shores together again so that they interact creatively in the political, economic and cultural arenas and so that an integrated and secure Mediterranean in which its inhabitants can enjoy peace and prosperity can once again come into being. But taken as a whole, the Mediterranean has had great potential throughout its history. During periods of integration, the sum of its parts is and always has been impressive. I'll give you one remote historical example, the massive and regular grain traffic supplying ancient Rome with food supplies from Tunisia and Egypt. Although no one before or after the Romans has managed to achieve political control over the entire sea, which was truly Mare Nostrum, our sea. Nowadays, however, the countries on the northern shores of the Mediterranean look to Brussels for a solution to their economic problems. They've turned their back on the Mediterranean, I would suggest. However, economic interdependence can, in the right conditions, have the capacity to reduce tensions and, in the wrong conditions, to inflame them, as we saw during the Greek crisis in 
years ago. There's another feature of the Mediterranean in past times that has to be emphasized, and that is the, the Mediterranean has been a principal meeting point for the three Abrahamic religions, and interaction among these faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, has been regular and at times intense, sometimes hostile, but often creative. Although it is tempting to think of the period of the Crusades or the great Spanish-Turkish wars of the 16th century as proof of the lack of integration in the Mediterranean, we can also find plenty of evidence for long peaceful interludes during which Christian and Jewish merchants established themselves in trading colonies along the coast of Islamic North Africa and the Levant, and consumers in Western Europe eagerly bought Eastern goods obtained from or through the Mediterranean, silk and sugar from the Mediterranean, spices brought up the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. Trading communities from Venice, Genoa, Florence and Barcelona built the commercial institutions we know today, banks, insurance, maritime law, to serve the interests of their trade networks that encompass the Mediterranean. Religious barriers did not have to be commercial barriers. The Dukes of Tuscany opened the previously obscure port of Livorno to merchants of all faiths in the 16th century, and the city flourished as a great center of exchange linked to Tunis, Smyrna, Izmir, and all the rest of the Mediterranean. All this created a series of diasporas around the shores of the Mediterranean. Cosmopolitan port cities emerged that acted as hosts to mixed communities of people of many religions, ethnic origins, and cultural outlooks. One example is Istanbul, for the area north of the Golden Horn, Pera Galata, was home to thousands of Italian merchants in the Middle Ages and after. The most remarkable case of a cosmopolitan eastern Mediterranean city is Alexandria, ever since its foundation by Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC. Early in the 20th century, Europeans accounted for 15% of the population, even if it was they who exercised most of the economic power. In 1927, there were about 49,000 Greeks in the city and 24,000 Italians. Overlapping with various nationalities, there were 25,000 Jews. Influential Muslim families, including the royal family, hailed from Turkey, Albania, Syria, or Lebanon. It is interesting to observe that they, as much as the settlers of European descent, wished to identify strongly with European, particularly French, culture and to acquire European technology. Indeed, the 19th century ruler of Egypt, Ismail Pasha, went further and expressed the view that Egypt must become part of Europe, I quote. The city was seen as a bridge linking Europe to Africa and Asia, and the Latin phrase Alexandria ad Egyptum was understood to mean Alexandria on the way to Egypt, next to Egypt, rather than in Egypt. Now, we might say today that the emphasis on being European denigrated local culture and achievements with their remarkable history. But we can also recognize that the attempt to create a common world was not simply the product of aggressive colonialism. Nationalist movements within the multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire beginning in 19th century Greece challenged this pluralistic outlook. In an age of rising nationalism, expulsion, right from danger, forced assimilation, even mass extermination in the case of the Armenians in Smyrna, Izmir, and the Sephardic Jews of Salonika, Thessaloniki, transformed one city after another in the old Ottoman realm. And by the 1950s, the port cities of the Eastern Mediterranean had largely ceased to be places of ethnic and religious coexistence. Meanwhile, Ottoman sovereignty in North Africa, often more theoretical than real, was replaced in that area 
by direct colonial rule by competing powers based in Western Europe. In the era of colonialism, starting with the French conquest of Algeria in 1830, the new rapport was created across the Mediterranean, a hegemonic one that insisted on the more civilized, évolué character of the northerners as opposed to the inhabitants of its southern shores. In, by 1881, when a French protectorate was created in Tunisia, the region already contained 70,000 Italian settlers, many from Sicily, and 12,000 settlers from the tiny island of Malta, the British island. By the time of decolonization, following the Second World War, the European colonies in North Africa were home to one and a half million settlers from France, Spain, Italy, and elsewhere, with well over a million in Algeria alone. Among the Algerian settlers, only a minority could actually claim a French origin, and this sense of common Latin, but not French origins, was reflected in the colonialist boast that the settlers were restoring Latinity to the Mediterranean 1500 years after the fall of the Roman Empire. Yet the colonists' descendants were to depart, to depart back to Europe in the second half of the 20th century, along with large numbers of indigenous inhabitants, many of whom settled on the northern shores of the Mediterranean, above all in southern France. Tensions generated in North Africa during the era of decolonization were then transferred to cities such as Nice and Marseille. The emancipation of the colonized from the colonizers in the second half of the 20th century has had several important effects, most notably the fracturing of the Mediterranean into northern and southern zones that to a large extent operate apart from one another. Places such as Alexandria, once celebrated for the meeting of cultures, religions, and peoples have become monochrome cities inhabited solely by the majority population of the interior. To say this is not in any way to defend the actions of the colonizers, which were notably in Algeria, often brutal and counterproductive. However, decolonization coincided with the attempts of the Soviet Union to establish a foothold within the Mediterranean, creating political and economic alliances that accentuated existing tensions within the Eastern Mediterranean, notably that between Israel and its Arab neighbors. The Jews in particular disappeared from all those lands in the Mediterranean where they had formed an integral and highly productive part of a larger society, countries like Tunisia and Morocco, Algeria, migrating to one embattled corner, Israel, or sometimes to France, bringing to an end a 2,000-year history of diaspora around the shores of the Mediterranean. Seen from this perspective, the creation of Israel was another episode in the fragmentation of the Mediterranean into national entities, as different ethnic and religious groups carved out their own territories and peoples were shunted around, beginning with the Greeks and the Turks in the population exchanges of the 1920s and continuing in more recent times with the Palestinians. The disparities in wealth between the northern and southern shores of the Mediterranean have, of course, stimulated an intensive, generally illicit human traffic across the sea. This is something we might want to stop and think about later. Until the 19th century, this included the sad story of the international slave trade, resulting in the forcible redistribution around the Mediterranean of captives from as far away as what is now Ukraine. Much more recently, the Mediterranean has become the theater in which many migrants from Black Africa have tried, often at the risk of their life, to enter the wealthy lands of the European Union. This movement of people is not going to slow down. The phenomenal rise in population in the sub-Saharan countries, such as Nigeria, reflects enormous improvements in healthcare and a significant decline in infant mortality. Younger members of an emerging middle class with aspirations to higher education and to a career in medicine or engineering or whatever 
see Europe as the obvious place where they can hope to find the opportunities that do not exist at home. As we know, this wave of migration has been compounded by migration out of North Africa, particularly Libya, during the current upheavals, as well as migration into the Aegean and beyond from the terrible civil war in Syria and the hinterland of Western Asia. And then, of course, there's another type of migration, temporary but transformative, people from Northern Europe and elsewhere converging on the Mediterranean in search of summer sun, a mass phenomenon of the late 20th century that has transformed the local industries, the labor market, the physical appearance, the social and cultural norms of towns and villages along virtually the entire coastline of Spain, France and Italy, and increasingly in Turkey, Tunisia and other Mediterranean lands. What we see is a heavy interdependence between the tourist industry within the Mediterranean and the economies of Northern Europe, injecting a further element of fragility into the economy of most Mediterranean countries, particularly now during the coronavirus pandemic, when popular destinations are suddenly rendered inaccessible. Meanwhile, the lands on the northern flank of the Mediterranean have seen their destiny as a European one, turning their backs on the Mediterranean to participate in a European Union whose strongest economies lie away from the Mediterranean. Weaknesses in the economy of every EU territory within the Mediterranean have only increased the sense of a fractured Mediterranean. The big question to me is how the relationship between the northern and southern shores of the Mediterranean can be reconstituted. Increasing wealth among the Moroccan middle classes still has to be matched by a massive improvement in the condition of the urban and rural majority. Libya would have the chance to benefit from massive energy resources if peace were to come, but the prospects seem poor. The coronavirus crisis means that resolving the relationship with the non-EU countries around the Mediterranean will become an even less significant priority for the existing members of the Union, with all that implies for the people who actually live in the Mediterranean. Prospects for the creation of tight bonds linking all the Mediterranean countries and peoples in common enterprises fade. The 21st century Mediterranean remains therefore broken and in need of repair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Abulafia, for your wonderful words, on which we will definitely reflect as part of our soul searching during this Biennale Abita world. We greatly appreciate your esteemed contribution and sincerely hope to have you in Italy and in the Mediterranean to continue our discussions and reflection. I'll leave the, world, the word to our chair, Claudia De Stefano, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Passing on to our next speaker, we are delighted to have with us today the president of the Mediterranean Citizens Assembly Foundation, an ever supporting partner of Habitat World. In his honor, I will revert to Spanish. I shall then resume his insights at the end of his speech and tra translate to English for you. Vicente Garcés es un ingeniero agrónomo y político valenciano, concejal del Ayuntamiento de Valencia, Diputado de las Cortes Valenciana y diputado en el Parlamento Europeo. Ha sido profesor de la Universidad Politécnica de Valencia. Ha sido diputado del Parlamento Europeo. En la actualidad es miembro del Comité Nacional del PSPV PSOE y coordinador de la corriente de la opinión izquierda socialista del PSPV. Ha sido presidente del Centro de Estudios Rurales y Agricultura Internacional. Presidente de honor de la Asociación Ciudadana Muestra Viva del Mediterráneo. Es presidente de la Fundación Asamblea de Ciudadanos y Ciudadanas del Mediterráneo. 
Señor presidente, nos gustaría invitarle a compartir su visión sobre los cambios y la situación actual en el Mediterráneo y saber si tiene alguna propuesta o iniciativa que podemos hacer juntos, digamos, con la World Habitat. Le dejo la palabra. Muchas gracias. The microphone, please. Vuelvo a empezar. Thank you. Gracias. Bueno, eh, he dicho que he dado las gracias a los organizadores por invitarme. Gracias también por darme la oportunidad de hablar en español. Es una prueba de la riqueza lingüística y cultural del Mediterráneo. Y estaba diciendo que la Fundación Asamblea de Ciudadanos y Ciudadanas del Mediterráneo es una organización no gubernamental constituida, como su nombre indica, por ciudadanos y ciudadanas a título personal. Es... Eh, una fundación con personalidad jurídica constituida en, en España, en Valencia, y que está articulada como red a través de 29 círculos ciudadanos que están presentes en 20 países del Mediterráneo. Es una red ciudadana que tiene 10 años de vida y que ha construido a lo largo de, de su historia una capacidad de dar voz a los ciudadanos y a las ciudadanas directamente y ha construido una amplísima red de colaboraciones con instituciones públicas de todo tipo presentes en el Mediterráneo. La podemos definir a la Fundación ACM como una red de de diálogo, de proposición y de acción ciudadana, configurada alrededor de valores y principios muy universales, los valores de, y principios de la libertad, eh, eh, la democracia, el respeto de los derechos humanos, la tolerancia, el reconocimiento de la diversidad, y la voluntad de resolver pacíficamente los conflictos. Claro, nuestra fundación como red ciudadana se encuentra en un contexto, es el, el Mediterráneo, eh, que es la cuna de tres religiones monoteístas, que es la cuna de grandes descubrimientos a través de la historia en materia científica, técnica, es eh, un mar que lo definió una vez eh, nuestro amigo Paul Balta, desgraciadamente ya fallecido, como el mar Mediterráneo, el Mediterráneo, 
cuna del futuro. Él decía, le Mediterranean verso de la venida. Eh, claro, cuna del futuro significa que tiene presente y tiene pasado. El Mediterráneo y los pueblos que conviven en sus vertientes norte, sur y este, eh, son pueblos que tienen siglos de relación entre ellos, de relación de todo tipo, cultural, comercial. Son pueblos que, que han construido su historia a veces con la palabra, a veces con la espada, a veces con la colaboración y la cooperación y a veces con la guerra. Tenemos pues detrás nuestro, de nuestro presente, toda una historia que el, el profesor Abufalía ha, 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 ha caracterizado y yo no repetiré. Tenemos detrás nuestro y en nuestro presente un contexto que requiere de una, una gran capacidad para, para observar y ver realmente eh, su desarrollo. En, en esos momentos, el Mediterráneo está eh, lleno de conflictos. Eh, si las primaveras árabes abrieron una esperanza de futuro para los pueblos, diez años después eh, esas esperanzas o bien han sido frustradas o bien inclusive ha habido una involución. Eh, tenemos guerras eh, en las dos riberas, tenemos eh, una Unión Europea que no acaba de definir bien sus políticas en relación con esa realidad del Mediterráneo. El proceso de Barcelona y la Unión por el Mediterráneo no. El proceso de Barcelona terminó sin, sin alcanzar sus objetivos. La Unión por el Mediterráneo está en desarrollo, pero tampoco llega a... A, a señalar un, un, un espacio común donde la integración de los países del Mediterráneo avance de manera decidida. Tenemos eh, eh, potencias extranjeras, potencias de fuera del Mediterráneo, eh, que estuvieron presentes durante el siglo, algunas del, del siglo XX, eh, potencias an, antiguas ya. Eh, coloniales durante el XIX, pero ahora en el siglo XXI eh, las viejas potencias y las nuevas potencias están todas en el Mediterráneo y configurando eh, espacios de, de confrontación alrededor de intereses que no son exclusivamente los de los pueblos del Mediterráneo, sino que hay intereses de todo tipo eh, que están batallando en estos momentos en, lo, en nuestro mar, en el mar en nuestro. Tenemos un, un contexto, pues, eh, difícil, eh, complejo, en el que eh, podríamos decir que el Mediterráneo está en emergencia. Tenemos una emergencia medioambiental, eh, derivada del cambio climático, derivada de la contaminación extrema del mar Mediterráneo, una emergencia climática que va profundizando los factores alrededor de las dificultades por el agua y alrededor de la desertificación y, y también empuja, empujando franjas de migración. Eh, tenemos una una emergencia social y económica eh, con desigualdades crecientes entre los países del norte al sur y en el interior de los países. Tenemos eh, un, una emergencia, eh, eh, además agudizada en estos momentos, eh, por eh, la pandemia. La pandemia ha venido de improviso y está tensionando todos los 
eh, problemas que ya teníamos eh, como mar Mediterráneo y ante ese cúmulo de, de situaciones que se expresan en esa frase de emergencia mediterránea, eh, los ciudadanos y las ciudadanas del Mediterráneo se encuentran sometidos a una doble presión. La presión de los conflictos existentes, la presión del desarrollo de tensiones y de intereses eh, de todo tipo que les afectan negativamente y ante la dificultad de avanzar de una manera tranquila, serena, sosegada, hacia crear condiciones de progreso. Eh, nosotros como Fundación de Ciudadanos y Ciudadanas del Mediterráneo decimos que eh, practicamos la diplomacia ciudadana, es decir, expresamos la voluntad de caminar hacia eh, puntos de integración de los pueblos del Mediterráneo, hacia una comunidad de pueblos del Mediterráneo, eh, pero también observamos las enormes dificultades para esos avances. Por eso decimos que la ciudadanía, ante una situación de emergencia como la que estamos viviendo, está obligada a situarse en una posición de resistencia. Ante la emergencia del Mediterráneo, hemos de practicar la resistencia ciudadana. Resistencia ciudadana alrededor de valores, de principios, de objetivos, que son los que hemos venido definiendo. Resistencia ciudadana para no claudicar y aceptar situaciones como la, las crisis de los flujos migratorios y los refugiados y la conversión del mar Mediterráneo en un cementerio. Ante hechos como esos, hemos de poner la, la, la resistencia, la voluntad de resistir. Ese es nuestro mensaje en estos momentos como fundación hacia los ciudadanos y ciudadanas del Mediterráneo. Y es evidente que tenemos eh, en el horizonte la necesidad, la obligación de crear sinergias, de buscar aliados, de eh, hacer posible alianzas. Eh, pues el World Habitat, sin duda, tiene que ser eh, eh, un eje de esas alianzas eh, de futuro. Eh, termino diciendo que, eh, que hay, quien, hay quienes piensan que el Mediterráneo, o que la Unión Europea, eh, su futuro está en África y que por lo tanto es eh, eh, orientar toda la acción exterior de la Unión Europea hacia África como un futuro eh, que vendrá. Es una vertical, hay quien le llama eso vertical, la vertical Unión Europea-África. Nosotros pensamos que esa vertical no es suficiente, que hemos de mantener también la horizontal. La horizontal es no fracturar al Mediterráneo entre Oriente y Occidente, hacer posible que la construcción de puentes entre, entre el este y el oeste del Mediterráneo, esa es la horizontal. Entonces el Mediterráneo está en el cruce de la vertical y la horizontal, y en ese cruce es donde estamos nosotros, los mediterráneos, y es ese cruce el que hemos de fortalecer con esa perspectiva de construir una comunidad de pueblos del Mediterráneo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias y thank you for that uh, for that presentation. Uh, the points uh, will be summarized of your speech in the chat box. So 
For those of you who don't speak Spanish, you will have a short summary in the chat box for your information. Our next honor speaker is Linda Tino Ledurain, a seasoned international expert at UNESCO. Linda is the coordinator of the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities, uh, ICCAR, a UNESCO platform that advocates for global solidarity and collaboration to promote inclusive urban development free from all forms of discrimination. Since April 2020, she has created and organized a series of webinars entitled Inclusion in the Time of COVID-19 uh, that address racism, uh, discrimination and exclusion. For over a decade, she has been working with UNESCO on a diverse and challenging range of critical issues from human rights, gender equality and the fight against racism and discrimination. She was a member of the Foresight Section team working with futurists from around the world and organising UNESCO's future forums and lectures. She has lectured and published works on the evolution of human rights, including uh, 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 in the in Southeast Asia. Madam, it is a pleasure to have you with us today for this webinar. It would be a great honour to hear your views on the topic from the point of view of the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities of UNESCO. Are there any new initiatives that we can do together with UNESCO within the Biennale during the coming years? I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, good day, everybody. I am honored to be part of this distinguished panel of speakers. First of all, let me thank the President Anika Patregnani and the rest of her team in Habitat World for having invited UNESCO to be part of this online conference. Um, as you may know, uh, UNESCO is the UN agency in charge of uh, the education, sciences, culture, and communication. And uh, now, with my participation, I would like to give a perspective from the social and human sciences sector of UNESCO. I have a short um, presentation. Uh, yes, can you see? the slides yes so i would thank you very much i would like to uh give you a perspective uh from the city level because this is what is one of the platforms that uh, unesco is working with it is called the international coalition of inclusive and sustainable cities it was launched in 2004 under the original name of the International Coalition of Cities Against Racism. That is why we have the acronym ECAR. It was uh, launched uh, during the uh, World Conference Against Racism in Durban. And uh, since then, it has grown to be a global network of more than 500 cities around the world. So what is the platform doing? It is a platform that aims to put a global front against racism and discriminations by using different mechanisms through inclusive policy making processes, through different capacity building mechanisms, working with social and um, civil society actors, and also with universities. It is also a platform where we could conduct different advocacy initiatives, awareness raising campaigns against racism and discrimination, and of course, to build a larger community of practice of social actors around the world that fight against discrimination and its different forms. Now, each city is uh, committed to a 10-point plan of action. Uh, this is a set uh, of commitments of the cities that are um, um, pertaining to the different anti-discrimination policies against um, uh, racism uh, related to the education sector, related to employment, uh, to cultural activities, and to housing. 
I would like to show you the different um, uh, 10 point plans of action in the European coalition, for example. So I will not be reading the 10 point plan of action, but you will see that these are different commitments to which the cities adhere to so that all citizens and including those that are in the most vulnerable of situations are able to live in social harmony and in social cohesion in the urban space. So this is the example of the 10 point plan of action in the European coalition. And in the next slide, you will find the similar set of commitments of the 10 point plan of action in the coalition of Arab cities. So you can see that um, there are different uh, cities, of course, in the European coalition and in the Arab region where uh, the Mediterranean region is uh, located. So there are different exchanges between these different cities. Our main thrust is that these cities work together with the same vision of having an inclusion and uh, diversity pillar in the construction of the urban space. Now, um, in the different regions of the coalition, uh, we have established different activities that are based on the commitments of the Global Steering Committee. The next slide, please. Now, I told you earlier that the coalition was named International Coalition of Cities Against Racism. That's why this was, it's called ECAR. But given the new sustainable development goals that the international community adopted, and with the new urban agenda also adopted in Habitat 3 in 2016, ECAR has expanded its mandate in order to look into the different kinds of discrimination. Now, in 2016, ECAR adopted the Bologna Declaration. And in here, you will see some excerpts of the declaration, which shows the commitment of the cities to the different elements of the human face of the crisis in the region. For example, uh, there are social transformations that affected a lot in human mobility, migration, in the rights of indigenous peoples, climate change. These are all the new emerging social transformations that the cities think are also primordial as commitments in their membership in the coalition. Now, the next declaration, next slide, please was adopted in Nancy in France in 2018. Now, there is a stronger commitment from the different cities in the promotion of social cohesion in cities. The principles of human rights and gender equality are the highest priorities in the coalition of cities. And of course, it is also looking at the different emerging phenomena at that time including the rise of hate, bigotry, violent extremism, and the growing worldwide phenomena that accentuate racism. So we think that within the international coalition at that time, it was very important to look into the issues once again of the social ills that are reaping their ugly head in the different social transformations in the different regions of the coalition. So to operationalize these commitments, several initiatives have been undertaken by the cities. Next slide, please. Now I mentioned to you that we are uh, looking into policy making. So policy making, not only those coming from the officials themselves. There has to be some consultation from the different stakeholders in the city. And in this situation, we are relying very much on research institutions, on academia, on the civil society organizations, and of course, the different grassroots organizations that will inform the policy making process. Now, together with the European Training and Research Center in Graz in Austria, the European cities 
in the coalition have developed the toolkit for equality. The toolkit for equality is a, a simple model of how citizens can be involved with the local governments in designing and in implementing inclusive policies. So it means there is some dialogue spaces that are being created between the government officials and the citizens themselves. And this uh, specific good practice was also replicated in the coalition of Arab cities recently in 2019. So the toolkit is a successful um, model in which the different um, stakeholders in the cities were given the opportunity to design conceptually what is an inclusive city, what are the legal frameworks that are behind uh, that can give rise to inclusiveness in the city, what data and what information are available so that we will be have will be able to have inclusive urban planning and what are the implementation stages where the different stakeholders in the cities can be implicated now there are very practical checklists involved in the toolkit for equality so it is a tool that is concretely helping the city authorities that will be able to make them adhere to the 10-point plan of action that they are committed to in the international coalition. Now, what is an important um, element in the um, tool that is done together with EPC grads in the coalition of Arab cities is it has involved a lot uh, the youth as a main stakeholder in the process of this uh, design of the different policy making process. So there is sports for youth inclusion as a main element in the toolkit for equality. And this is also um, being um, framed within the UNESCO uh, frameworks. Uh, for example, we have the UNESCO Charter on Physical Education and Sport, and there is also the Kazan Action Plan, which was adopted by the ministers of sport, which sees sport as a tool that can enhance social inclusion in the city space. There is also um, a big deal of um, concepts that are involved in the toolkit for equality including the access to information what are the methods and mechanisms used by the cities so that the city's population can have the accurate information and making it available to the general public and within the context of the covid19 uh, pandemic this has been a very um, relevant tool for the cities to use now, another element that is also highlighted in the toolkit is the human rights and citizenship education. So this is uh, part of the education and the training initiatives and the programs that are implemented by the cities so that there is an improvement of the awareness and the culture of citizenship and human rights among the civil servants and the public in general. Now, next slide please. Now, what is important is, as I told you, the role of youth. Now, of course, the international coalition has been working with city officials as the main interlocutors, but we are also, of course, looking into expanding our uh, partnerships with associations, including youth organizations. Now, one of the stellar programs that UNESCO has come up with in the Mediterranean is called the NetMed Youth Project, the Networks of Mediterranean Youth. This network was able to work with hundreds of um, associations and thousands of youth leaders within the Mediterranean, which have uh, enabled them to increase their capacities to become youth leaders and have more youth participation in the local decision-making processes. This has been a, uh, a successful program where the visibility of youth, not, not only as actors where we invite so that we are able to have 
youth tokenism in our programs? No, we wanted the youth leaders to be themselves implementing their projects that they are designing themselves. Now, another very interesting UNESCO project, which is still uh, ongoing, is the youth employment in the Mediterranean project. So it develops the technical and vocational uh, capacities of youth in the Mediterranean so that they will be able to find the skills needed for their well-being and to enhance their employment opportunities. Now, last but not the least, as an example of a UNESCO project that is involving youth, is the Masterclass Series Against Racism and Discriminations. Now, this, I think, is one of the most important in our day and time, given the current uh, context that we are living in. We designed this Masterclass Series Against Racism and Discriminations in order to give training to young leaders around the world on how to sensitize themselves on the different concepts underlying racism. So this is a partnership that we had with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and a museum here in France, which looked into the deeper understanding of how prejudices are individually developed amongst ourselves. It is a deconstruction of our own psyches that lead to racist attitudes and behavior. We are currently trying to scale up this masterclass series and uh, using an online forum. Now, within this context, we are, we are organizing one actually next week on July 21st. Uh, and um, there is a possibility that we will be doing this uh, perhaps physically in the autumn. And we think that this is a very relevant exercise so that the youth leaders will be able to understand how to deconstruct racism themselves so that they will become their own uh, trainers in their own schools and in their own communities. Um, what we think now is the vision of the social and human sciences of UNESCO as we face the different challenges. Uh, maybe we can call it post COVID-19 or we can call it as UNESCO says the next normal. But what we think is as we face the rapid urbanization process and within the context of the uh, of uh, the COVID-19, this what we call the Urbanocene era. I think the vision is that we have to look into the human face of social transformations, the human face of rapid urbanizations, so that we will be able to highlight all the human values and the human thinking that need to be anchored in the construction of our futures. We are looking at the international coalition as a platform so that we could build a values-based governance, which is, of course, uh, strengthened by the values of justice, equality, anti-discrimination, and inclusion. Now, as I also mentioned, um, involving the wide citizenry and those of the vulnerable populations is an important tool in making that making sure that this human face of urbanization gets the proper um, uh, attention in how we build and construct our new societies. UNESCO is looking for partners, being network or knowledge or financial partners, so that we will be able to scale up our projects, including the Masterclass series and all the other youth projects that I mentioned. And so we are looking forward also with working with Habitat World and seeing synergies, connecting the dots, and reflect on how we could have each of us the comparative advantage to work towards the to, towards addressing the changes in 
the new post-COVID-19 era. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. I'm sure that your contribution is significant for many of us working in this field. And Habitat World pledges its utmost support and assistance to the implementation of your suggestions. Our next honor speaker is Carlo Triarico. Those of us, for those of us in Italy, I'm sure uh, we've been following his work in Florence and in the media. The doctor is a world-renowned um, history and of science specialist, president of the Association of Biodynamic Agriculture and vice president of the FEDARBIO organization. He is the director of the Institute of Specialization in Ag Agriculture and president of the AgriFound Foundation, a member of the Permanent Research Committee of Bioagriculture and Biodynamics for the Ministry of Agriculture in Italy. Many of you follow his splendid writings on the Osservatore Romano, where his intellect, insight and views are widely respected. He's also a scientific counsellor of the Italian Research Foundation in Biological Agriculture. He also has an academic background at the Universities of Florence, Naples, Pisa and at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. As president of the Biodynamic Agriculture Association and the director of the Institute in Florence, what are your views of the topic of today? I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you so much for your presence. So thank you. Can you hear me? Is is well? Okay. Uh, I I I want to say something about uh, uh, our position, like. Uh, uh, farmers and, and and people in general about uh, the trademark uh, and about food and freedom and uh, okay my, my starting question is uh, um, uh, whether we still need uh, to follow bilateral relations between states or can we work towards uh, um, multilateralism uh, Italy, for instance, Italy, which lies in the Mediterranean Sea, has preferred the Atlantic relationship, we know, and uh, it has neglected the, the Mediterranean. Um, the bilateral free trade treaties uh, under discussion now between, between Europe and, uh, for instance, the United States, but uh, also Canada, Mexico, and uh, even China, uh, I like a, a legal vacuum in the face of great change uh, and the, the, the lack of a global governance. We have, uh, we, we the, the farmers, but we the people, we have no institutions to define the, tra the treaties. A negotiation, uh, as known, uh, take place uh, and uh, not in, in institutional forums, are attended by unknown um, lobbyists in the in in the, are secret. There is no right to knowledge about them. The issue is even uh, the, the, the issue even more important. Uh, if uh, when when the most delicate barriers uh, they break down are not um, uh, border taxes but uh, principles workers' right, uh, food safety or health, uh, environment, etc. The treaties uh, provide that the right of reciprocity for the free entry of certain goods is obligatory, even if they are obtained in violation, violation of principles of production of the importing country. But there is also a more important issue, I, I think. There is a, the possibility that the violation of certain principles, uh, while leaving the material consistencies of the goods untouched, may contaminate them uh, on an ethical level through uh, unfair processes. 
that uh, are uh, made during their production when uh, goods are considered just material entities the we cannot refuse them to import uh, these goods uh, if we do that could appear to be an unjust unjustified uh, um, impediment to free trade however new questions need to be asked if a commodity it's uh, merely a, a material extensions does a community have the right to react it on the basis of its spiritual substance for example when it was produced in a country where workers health and environment were not respected is it right to recognize and respect that decision bilateral treaties already have an answer to this question and it is negative if there is a local measure to of uh, as i as, uh, as uh, i say protectionism of rights they provide through arbitration courts where producer can bring states and obtain compensation for lost earnings they can do this even if the goods violate ethical principles or are judged unmarked unmarketable um, uh, for for uh, for uh, for uh, different internal quality standards of a country uh, the crisis of uh, the legal instruments the legal instruments could instead be the occasion to conceive a general framework of new democratic and, and legal institution i think regulate, regulating the new phenomena of a globalized world uh, this must be done before new hegemonic system of global governance replace the old ones for instance, paternalistic um, hegemonic systems. Instead, uh, the timid appearance of a new examples of uh, egalitarian legal institutions should be um, well uh, helped. Uh, among these, in the international criminal is, is the international criminal criminal courts, for instance. Uh, a body born for the observation that today the, the different uh, juridical cultures of national states regulate crimes uh, up to the, uh, the death of a nepal but do not guard against the massacre of a people the predation of uh, uh, resources or persecution of oppositions we need to establish new fundamental human rights, such as the rights uh, about food and the right uh, um, to knowledge. The knowledge, for instance, about the public decision making processes. We need to, to support the, the organizations and, uh, first of all, the farmers' organizations that have risen to assert this important pioneering work these two rights the rights to share the bread the bread to eat and the, to share the bread of the knowledge are topical today free peoples all the free peoples have always reduced the internal misery and the, the most um, the, 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 the most odious forms of uh, of poverty it is a process that can be applied globally. Uh, this becomes a priority when it comes uh, to food. Uh, and, uh, and we need to reflect on freedoms when measures generate a conflict between commercial rights and human and civil rights. Um, the Latins, the, the, the ancient people, had a difference between lex and used. 
a law is always subordinate to higher rights. A law, a measure, could conflict with principles and therefore not be observed. That is why the last century established the right to civil disobedience and no violence, a superior form of public struggle through dialogue. It is called by, by Gandhi, uh, Satyagra, literally the power of truth. And its application uh, at this time, I think, uh, uh, would lead us to understand that uh, the, the customs barriers uh, to be broken now, to be broken down now uh, as a priority uh, of today are those of injustice. Uh, too many people, and the, the number increase every year, uh, have no food. But we have a big production of food. It's not a, a technical uh, aim, but it, the problem is a problem of uh, justice, and it's a problem of uh, the model of our model in the relationship. I, I think that the, the what we can uh, do in the Mediterranean. Uh, sea relationships in this moment can be also something new in a new model uh, and i think the multilateralism uh, can be made when you have uh, uh, some uh, treaties that are uh, bilateral and uh, and um, between uh, states that are, that are for instance rich and they want to exclude the power countries and the power people uh, in the right of food, um, this this is this make uh, everyone uh, power. Uh, I I think now we can establish a new model and the model uh, of the Mediterranean uh, Sea that in a, that is an historical one can be can be used to 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 make uh, something on new that is uh, in touch with the modernity but uh, but uh, the relationships uh, that, that are uh, not uh, unicentralistic but multicentralistic can be something that are in the forms itself of uh, this uh, sea and also in the is history for agriculture for food for the farmers i think this vital and very very important that we begin now thank you thank you for your contribution and uh, for your continued support and cooperation with the biennale habitat and we wish to continue this cooperation maybe in florence uh, in the next year grazie mille uh, mm -hmm. Our next two speakers are distinguished Italian researchers whom the Biennale Habitat is honoured to invite to this gathering to offer their views and insights with a bottom-up approach on reflection and views of the topic of the day, uh, human values and human thinking in the Mediterranean, reflecting on changes, emerging issues and new horizons. Our first speaker is Or Ornella Urpis of the University of Trieste, Department of Political and Social Sciences. She is an associate professor in general sociology. She works in the research programs of the Department of Political and Social Sciences. She, also, she has also collaborated with the healthcare institutions and with the Burlo Gara Garofalo Hospital in Trieste on various training programs. Author of numerous international essays on the issues of migration, women's health, identity, and in transborder programs in the Mediterranean. Many of us have followed your work, your contribution to civil society and research. Can you please elaborate on the issues that you have been working on and bridge them to the topic of today? Thank you.
Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the organizer um, for providing the opportunity to discuss the important topic on the relationship between cultural identity and human rights in Mediterranean Mediterranean area. I am a sociologist and I have been dealing with the immigration issue for many years. My focus has been the role of women in society and its relationship with the patriarchal models in migrant communities, or sexual equality between men and women. I have studied extensively the negative consequences of such patriarchal models um, so, uh, next, next slide, please. Um, the uh, consequences of such practical models on the social life of women in the new world and the consequent effect of segregation and social exclusion. In the late 1990s, I was responsible for a program in female genital mutilation and human rights in migrant communities funded by the Ministry of the Equal Opportunities, Italian min uh, Ministry. The program was uh, coordinated by the NGO Italian Association of Women for Development in Rome. My focus was uh, the behavior of women and men on Africa origin and their relationship with a traditional practice. Geography we study was uh, conducted in the Friuli Venezia Giulia, is a region of Italy, in northeast Italy. I would like um, I would like next uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, I would like to start with the topic of female genital mutilation. The phenomenon uh, of female genital mutilation is the product of traditional patriarch culture is a practice which is difficult to eradicate because the body of women is still considered a space where the identity of cultural group is written. Uh, further, in migration processes, the maintenance of tribal practices um, such as genital mutilation, for, for example, is functional to ability of the individual to recognize themselves as belonging to their group. In fact, migration processes do not automatically involve change the identity criteria when individuals find themselves in the new social environment. The relationship with the new world can produce if anything, an encaps encapsulation um, and a closure of tutors the outside, regardless of the social policies of the host country. Next slide, please. A part of my research work on the issue of female genital mutilation is work back, back, um, with the, the Bruno Garofalo Hospital. It's a, a great uh, hospital in, uh, here in Trieste. Uh, on a project which involved work with the first migrant reception center in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, a region in Italy. I remember some testimonies of women from Nigeria who would uh, perform practice on the clitoris uh, and their, uh, of their two years old daughter with the aim of reduce them. This buzz on their belief system that the clarities, clarities would out, um, um, uh, uh, otherwise become a dangerous. Other women from Somalia instead request, requested a surgery to address the narrowing on their vaginal opening uh, due to having been infibulated. Next. Uh, uh, next um, <laughs> Next. Um, however, uh, this um, caused fear amongst these uh, women uh, that if the matter would have become known in the public domain. 
Unfortunately, cultural mediators underestimate the importance of sexual sphere of immigrant women with respect to rejection, legal aspect, uh, or uh, to mention a few. There are many factors that preclude women's freedom and their right to exercise essential function. These factors require intervention as identified by European research, in particular, I refer to integral research from the University of Trieste. Uh, the first, uh, when I have a criteria, well, the first is knowledge of sexual disorders. Second, uh, knowledge of contraceptive. Three, uh, free uh, and uh, protected access to abortion. Four, protecting for uh, acts of sexual abuse perpetuated in the reception areas uh, by various actors and inclusive of male refugees. Uh, five, uh, the lack of recognition of the concept of sexual abuse. Many foreign come from patriarchal culture where women they don't have the freedom to choose their own destiny, let alone exercise, exercise uh, their sexual health mm -hmm. needs. Particularly, attention should be paid uh, to the knowledge of women's rights according to the European law and international conventions. The lack of knowledge of their um, unalienable uh, rights prevent them from recognizing when sexual or other types of abuse and violence is perpetrated in their bodies. For this reason, the, content, the contents of the Commit on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women should be disseminated. Another very important topic I, I would like to address today is the permanency uh, of the social practice of arranged marriage and forced marriage. Uh, the research shows uh, the absence of uh, exogamous in marriage in the community, in the cultural community, in many cultural community here in uh, Triuli Veneto Giulia. Uh, women have no freedom to the choice of their partner. In this studies community of Bangladesh in Mofalcone, uh, for example, Mofalcone is a city near city near Trieste, where there is a Fincantieri, and there work many Bangladesh people. Um, women get married after the age of 18, uh, and the choice of the spouse uh, always go through the family, and the marriage is prepared in advance. In this way, cultural and custom are maintained, maintain, and the community reproduces itself. But we had observed that this also happens to Pakistani women and the Kosovari women, for example, here and also in Slovenia. Uh, and many other immigrants, even if they lived uh, in our society for many, many years. So we can say that uh, endogamous marriage is a clear indica indication of lack of social integration. In conclusion, in conclusion, this is the um, um, which are the main indicators uh, we should consider it when assessing the degree of social integration from foreign communities. Well. Um, there are some important indicators uh, are to be founded when analysis foreign women, including uh, the first, the present uh, or no to endogamic marriage, uh, the second, the present on forced marriage, uh, three, the maintaining traditional practice of female genital mutilation, for example, or uh, other violence. Uh, uh, four, maintaining condition of female segregation. Five, the lack of work activity of women. Six, the no linguistic knowledge on women. This is very, very important in Italy. This is a great problem. 
seven, the uh, inability to relate independent to women's institution, institution, institution. <laughs> Uh, eight, the absence of scars present uh, of Italian friends, for example. Uh, nine, the abortion rate, uh, every uh, number or, or number of abortion. Ten, the presence of um, the um, venereal disease. Um, Eleven, no access to birth path and family counseling center. As you can see, in order to develop and implement a good integration policy, a focus on female condition and her sexual and reproductive health is needed. I would like to conclude my presenting uh, some results for, of the integral European research below and provide access to presentation uh, to all the participants in when in other moment <laughs> okay thank you thank you professor urpis uh, again abita world looks forward to continue to work with you on various topics of mutual interest the fact that your department interest has invested in this area is extremely important for the Mediterranean and we will surely follow up with new exciting initiatives together. Our next researcher is Marco Emanuele, who teaches democracy and totalitarianism at the Link Campus University of Rome. He is Edgar Morin's intellectual student and he can he conducts research on the complexity of the human condition and on complex thinking, also with a focus on international relations, on the evolution of democratic processes, and, uh, and is responsible for the geopolitical information website Line Strategica. Prof. Emanuele, thank you for, your, for being in this webinar. You are a thinker and a reflective analyst of the complex world with a daily blog on these issues. What are your reflections and studies on the topic of today? Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Uh, it's really an honor for me uh, to, to speak uh, in this uh, uh, very important and high level panel. But uh, today my topic is uh, Med Dialogues, Universities and the New Technologies. Um, I am a political philosopher and uh, uh, as uh, our uh, chairman said, I teach uh, democracy and uh, totalitarianism at Link Campus University. But uh, in speaking of dialogue, I refer um, to a process that uh, carries within itself a double dimension and uh, i think so uh, referring to the great lesson of uh, raymond panicker then uh, we have uh, dialogue and we have two dimensions the uh, dialectic one which concerns the mediation of interests and the power relations between individuals and structures including states and the second dimension of dialogue is the dialogical one, which concerns instead the depth of historical processes and the possibility capacity to look deep into what happens. Uh, my opinion is that the enlarged Mediterranean area is a, a laboratory in which we can measure in qualitative terms the complexity and the complexities of dialogue. The crisis that run through the enlarged Mediterranean context are so radical and call into question regional and external state actors to be faced only with new mediations and new projects. <clears throat> Uh, my question is, which players can play a decisive role in the MED dialogues, contributing to inaugurate conventional and unconventional but substantial roles to try to get out of the difficult that, that seem unsolvable? 
I think that networks of dialogue can be imagined and constructed real, realistically by the coordinated and the continuous action of reality like the civil society organization. In them including all those collective subjects who work in and not on the problems of reality without ideological point, point of, points of view, but with attention to the challenges that arise in reality and in the primary interest of suffering populations, often seeking a dignity of life. The other subjects are universities. And the university is a word that recalls the universality of knowledge in its indivisibility. And the university has the fundamental role of looking behind the sacred rooms of culture to give life to thought in reality. Well, in Italy, universities are required to invest in teaching, in research, and also in the so-called third mission. Link Campus, in particular, considers the third mission uh, the attention and relations with the external world, the true mission of the university that includes the others. Our external world, for us who live in the southern Europe, is naturally Mediterranean, our natural home. But I think that the time has come for internationalization processes to become real complex dialogue paths and help through education to develop contaminating and fertilizing approaches between cultures. This is not uh, an easy operation, but it is certainly necessary. Then universities must be considered strategic sub subjects in the Mediterranean area. While universities have not have geopolitical interests, they have the responsibility, as the general title, title of this initiative reminds us, to integrate <coughs> by cooperating and to prepare learners for democratic citizenship by educating and to innovate and stimulate creativity by training. With the new technologies, Universities can transform their potential for dialogue into real possibilities. Too often, in fact, we theoretically focus on the opportunities or on the risks generated by new technologies. Rarely, instead, we underline what technologies represent in terms of integration or positive experiences of community creation peace building, exchange and common growth, in particular in difficult or very difficult contexts. We must understand that our role is that of creators of the future and that only through systemic networks in dialogue, it is possible to try to get out of the difficulties of the present. The risk of radicalization is also in closed cultural attitudes that do not intend to open up to the knowledge of the other, that I consider the part of us <clears throat> that I do not yet know, and the other's experiences. When I speak of systemic networks, I refer to the need to integrate five areas the values of the principles, including religious ones, the cultural one of the different differences that make up the med mosaic, the political institution ones, the economic ones, and the legal of the law and of the rules ones. Choosing the, lo choosing the logic of integration means, dear friends, rejecting through experiences, the logic of a neo-colonialism that has characterized and still characterizes a certain Western attitude 
towards the countries of the southern hemisphere. In conclusion, the challenge is the challenge in front of us is on the one hand to work in the universities on critical thinking for dialogues and uh, for dialogues of integration, innovating through the new, the new technologies and sharing these innovations. On the other hand, the challenge is to rethink from reality the spaces, times and contents of a realistic Euro-Mediterranean partnership. <coughs> to achieve this, we must be prepared to engage dialogue with a truly open mind. My conclusion is a necessary, a necessary return to the future. In the 13th century, Raymond Lull, a Spanish mystic philosopher, genius of interculturality, at the time of the Crusades, tried to make a peaceful contribution to the encounter between religions. He learned Arabic and he made every effort to persuade Rome to found academic chairs in Coptic, Arabic and Greek in the emerging universities of the Christian world. He is certainly, I think, a very important example for all of us. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your participation. And may I say that your thoughts on the topic are extremely fascinating and require us to think more deeply about human values in this context. I'm sure that we can also expand our ex uh, understanding with your insights and your reflections. Thank you. Finally, we come to our honoured Secretary General of the Italian Network of the Euro Mediterranean Dialogue Ride Alps. Uh, Dr. Morinaro. He is extremely well known to all those working in the Mediterranean, as he is the fulcrum of most of the activities of institutions in Italy working within this context. Uh, he is the chairman, founder, organizer, and fundraiser of the non profit multidisciplinary research center Mediterranean Perspectives. He is a writer on the topics of uh, status quo in Jerusalem and its oily places, sovereignty and jurisdiction in international law, globalist and status model models of collective identity and European defense. Uh, may we thank Dr. Molinaro publicly for his support, advice, assistance and views which we are also grateful for. I give the floor to Dr. Molinaro, who we also share the views of Ambassador Enrico Granara from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Italian Cooperation, who couldn't be with, here with us today. Thank you, Dr. Molinaro, and the floor is yours. Uh, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Everything okay on your end? Yeah, we still can't hear you. OK, 
Okay, it looks like Dr. Molinaro is experiencing some technical difficulties. We will wait a few more minutes, see if we can sort this out. Can you hear me now? Uh, can, yes, can. You? thank you. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you, Eva Gabriele, for this uh, invitation. Uh, Habitat World is a member of our network, so we are happy to cooperate. And uh, <clears throat> with architect Patrignani, we agree that we could uh, also develop further our uh, cooperation because uh, we have the same values that we can uh, enhance our potential. Now, if you if you want, I can start to read the uh, the message from Ambassador Granada, who is the coordinator for Euromed of the Foreign Ministry since 2013. So he's the most expert in any multilateral uh, Euromed uh, format. And then I will uh, give my speech. So I, I read it. I read this text. Okay. Okay. My first association with Habitat World dates back to 2018 when I learned about its price awarded to an innovative urban recovery project in Egypt and to an equally innovative marine environmental project in the island of Crete. This, in a nutshell, is what I would define as a distinctive character of the Habitat World approach to all things Mediterranean. Their attention is now concentrated in the full development of the Habitat 2020-2022 ambitious program. It is therefore with the utmost interest that we are now following this new initiative enthusiastically promoted by Annika Patrignani and the Habitat partners through, throughout the Mediterranean Basin. We have already noticed their increased capacity in getting new culture partners involved in all those areas connecting the culture, heritage and environment with a special focus on sustainable urban development solutions. Habitat World's concern with all these cross-cutting issues makes it a valuable partner for all Euromed institutions. It is not by chance that the executive director of the Avenue Foundation has openly credited Habitat World for its high potential in the area of intercultural dialogue. Best wishes for your new endeavors. Enrico Granara, Euromed coordinator, Maishi Rome. Okay, yes, thank you. This is the, the image of Minister Granara. So, summarizing and concluding this uh, event, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, more than ever, as some of the speakers uh, stressed during their talks, uh, a network and coordination activity is needed. This is, this is the main strategic goal of the Italian network for the Annaline Foundation and the, the, the RIDA PS, the, 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 our association, which has uh, 100 uh, qualified uh, active members of the Euromed the civil society, including uh, municipalities such as Bologna, Palermo, Pesaro, or universities, public and private university research centers including uh, religious uh, communities, uh, um, trade unions, uh, and the organization of uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, like uh, the Sicilian Association, and for instance, the Falcone Foundation. So 
basically what we want to do is to make practical what you said until now to put a network between the different initiatives in the field of Euromed dialogue and cooperation and particularly in this uh, general uh, uh, best practice uh, of the Cerealia festival devoted every year to a different country this time is devoted to Jordan and that's why I was a bit late I'm sorry because I was hosted by the Jordanian ambassador here in Rome and um, basically we are, you are all invited to join our interinstitutional event in Ponce Island, uh, an island uh, in front of, of, of Rome where um, Altiero Spinelli, the forefather of the European Union, uh, was confined for two years until 39 and then uh, deported to the neighboring island of Ventotene where he published the famous manifesto which, has, uh, which celebrates eight years uh, next year. So basically, in this archipelago, so important for the beginning of the European idea, we want to extend, following also the, the ideas uh, emerging from this debate, uh, the cooperation uh, idea and strategy to the southern shore of the Mediterranean. That's why uh, we uh, got the logo from the Union for the Mediterranean of the 25th anniversary of Barcelona. And all the main stakeholders uh, will attend, including uh, Nasser Kamel, the Secretary General of the UFM, uh, Dr. Nabila Sharif, uh, representing the Annali Foundation, Professor Riccaboni, the president of the Prima Foundation, including 19 countries uh, working on uh, sustainability, in particular food security, um, circular economy, and the fight against uh, climate change. So we chose this island because we would like to launch a new manifesto, a manifesto on sustainability in view of the <coughs> celebration of the 25th anniversary of Barcelona, planned for uh, November 26th in the same uh, city. And because uh, we, we want to give a message that we believe uh, many issues we, you, you raised today, especially the, the issue related to sustainability, could be the main trade union between all the parties, not only the north and the south, but also the parts of the southern shore of the Mediterranean that are in conflict. Reading the text of the Barcelona Declaration, you can see that uh, the, the basis, the preamble, is the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace negotiations uh, at that time started in Madrid. And this is why it's important to connect the two main organizations that include those two countries, which are the, the UFM and the, um, our uh, Annaline Foundation. This is why on May 15, 2018, we organized the first interinstitutional meeting between the two leaders, Nabila Sharif and uh, Nasser Kamel in Palermo on the occasion of the World Food World Organization. World the conference for Mediterranean diet. The second meeting was December 6th at the, at the Foreign Ministry of Italy, where we extended the invitation to UN organizations such as, such as UNAOC, the High Representative Moratinos. And we want to extend the invitation to our Ponsa Prima Med event scheduled for September 14, also to UNESCO, possibly the, the, the Director General Azulai, because we believe many the issues we discuss, both in terms of the uh, water and the environment in terms of education because we want to fight against the, the labor mismatch the, the, the problem the main problem probably in the Mediterranean of the students who have a high education qualified education but the the trend market is going to a different direction so we want to build in the island for the first time a Euromed laboratory for sustainability of innovation and research open to all the talented uh, uh, young uh, uh, men and women scholars uh, in the area, in the region. And again, we hope to, to answer to some of your requests and appeals uh, you, you raised during this uh, uh, very significant conference. Uh, but we also, we want to have your partnership, not only Habitat, but also the speakers and the organization that you represent today for the success of this uh, annual initiative because we want to, to reach a, a point where at least on this issue, 
all the region, all the partners, all the stakeholders agree, and we can go back to the to the original uh, idea of uh, Barcelona Declaration 1995, where among the three baskets, culture, economy, and security, there is a strict connection. There is no proliferation plurif of institutions but that overlap to each other, but they, they, they cooperate with each other at the regional and world level. So this is also a, a request on my part on behalf of the Italian civil society to all of you, and I hope to get your precious help and advice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Molinaro, for, for your kind words, your insights and your contribution. And thank you for uh, um, bringing the message from Ambassador Enrico Granara to us. Uh, we will uh, we look forward to supporting your initiatives and your work plans for the Mediterranean as, as well as uh, continuing our support for you personally. Um, I would like now to thank you all participants of this uh, webinar. We had more than 200 participants and I would like to thank our partners Abitawal, for organising this webinar and all his partners. I would like to thank the, our special guest, His Excellency Nabil Sharif, our chairpersons, Clelia Di Stefano and Ricardo Maranova, and our panel of distinguished speakers, Gulsun uh, Saglamer, David Dabulafia, Vincente Miguel Garces Ramon, Lin, Linda Tino Le Durain, uh, Carlo Triarico, Ornella Urpis, Marco Angelo Emanuele and Dr. Enrico Molinaro for his concluding remarks. And I would like also to thank uh, Enrico Granara for his kind words. Uh, we look forward to uh, working with all of you again and uh, on new initiatives with the Biennale Habitat over the course of the next three years. And we welcome any additional support and assistance from any of our participants today. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed today's webinar. Uh, we personally found them uh, found this uh, presentation extremely insightful and useful. And thank you so much for participating. And this is the end of the webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>